So Hold on, let me get straight. Let me get. Let yeah, me can get you some. please? Can you please get I mean, yourself you much, figured this, out? Does this room slope? No, what it doesn't slope. You're just a midget. From but, your waist. Do you know what the deal is? You got Fred Flintstone legs, and your upper torso is like four feet long. That's the problem. <laughs> is that what it is? Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for that enlightenment. You now that torso. we've discussed. So you get that. Yeah, I bet your pant legs are what, 30 inches? <laughs> okay. Yeah, can you push your mic way? up? Okay. Can you push your mic up and your volume down, you please? Need to shut your mouth. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. I listen. Okay. Are we, are we recording everywhere? Oh, yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. Here we go. So what's up, everyone? Welcome to the That Church Podcast. This is week, gosh, four of Angels and Demons. This week, we are talking about angel stories in Scripture. So we are talking specifically. We're not going to waste any time. This is a podcast for That Church and the world, uh, and it's hosted by myself and Dad, uh, Pastor Scott Harness of That Church in Sherwood, uh, and then myself, uh, Pastor Kendall Harness of That Church in Cabot. So uh, mm-hmm. with that said, I want to jump into this because I think we've got a boatload of content to cover. We had a pre mm-hmm. we had a pre show meeting and. The pre-show meeting was like an hour and a half. Even Brady was pointing out how long the pre-show <laughs> meeting was. Um, he's like, dude, I thought I missed the podcast. I'm like, no, it was just the pre-show meeting. Sorry. Um, but jumping into this content, uh, angel stories in scripture. One of the first angel stories that we kind of have in scripture that's a dedicated angel story is Genesis chapter 6. Mm-hmm. Um, Genesis chapter six is a story of a group of angels that rebel against kind of what God wants them to do. And they get with humanity. We'll talk more about the story in a second, but kind of set that story up for me, if you will. Yeah. So I think, first of all, it's really important. And you and I both discuss this, you know, even sifting through scripture, looking at very reputable sources, talking to people that we know have a heart for God and who have made themselves a student of the Bible. Um, there's still a lot of things about angels that we don't know. And yeah. there's just some pieces that we're going to do the best we can to, to be as definitive as we can, <clears throat> you know, really depending on, you know, what the Bible gives us, but there's, there's still some pieces that are missing. Here's what we know about this story. First of all, which, which makes this stand out is that in human history, the Bible tells us that um, it reveals that there's two global judgments. In other words, where God absolutely brings punishment, global punishment to the earth um, because of her rebellion. And uh, one of them is in history, and that's when we're going to look at. That's the flood. Mm -hmm. The other one is yet to come, and that's at the final judgment. And so this one is the very first time God absolutely destroys the earth, um, and he does it with water. And it's the story of Noah, but there's a lot to this story. I think one of the things we want to zero in on here is, is why did God do that? Why, why did God, what was the purpose behind God going to such extreme measures to, to destroy the earth? And I think that's what we need to look at. And so you're going to, you're going to walk us through the story. Yeah. Cause Genesis chapter six is the story of Noah, but, but I think it is interesting to note that the story of Noah is the story of God flooding the earth. And yep. that is a that's a heck of a judgment and this is this story sort of explains the reasoning or at least some of the reasoning behind that harsh punishment so it, we pick up the story in Genesis chapter 6 verses 1 through 8 it says this it says then the people began uh, to multiply on the earth and daughters were born to them the sons of God saw the beautiful women and took any they wanted as their wives then the Lord said my spirit will not put up with humans for such a long time for they on, for they are only mortal flesh in the future their normal life lifespan will be no more than 120 years. In those days and for some time after, giant Nephilites lived on the earth for whenever the sons of God had intercourse with women, they gave birth to children who became the heroes and famous warriors of ancient times. The Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth, and he saw that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. So the Lord was sorry he had ever made them and put, on, and put them on the earth. It broke his heart. And the Lord said, I will wipe this human race I have created from the face of the earth. Yes, I will destroy every living thing, all the people, the large animals, the small animals that scurry along the ground, and all and even the birds of the sky. I am sorry I ever made them. But Noah found favor with the Lord. So obviously this leads into the story of Noah and the building of the ark and all those different things. Um, But from there, we see this basically there's a group of 
angels, sons of God. So we kind of want to talk in, about that. Do you want to talk about Job and kind of what that looks yeah. like? Who are these these sons of God that are spoken of in in Genesis chapter six? Well, um, we believe that they're they're a class of angels. Angels, yeah. And, you know, we use the word angels very broadly. The, the title angel means messenger or it means one sent. And so so we have these these angelic beings, but it's, it's much deeper than that. But let's just kind of look at it and see how we get that these are some type of spiritual being angels, that's been yeah. created. Um, Job chapter 38 and verse 7 says, The morning stars sang together, and as the sons of God shouted for joy. This was at the, the setting of the foundations of the earth. Um, the sons of God were there. And we've already seen in other teachings that this is a reference to the angels. Um, Job 1.6 also says, now there was a day when the sons of God presented themselves before the Lord and Satan also came among them. So we see that title, sons of God, given again. We see enough consistency in scripture that the sons of God is a reference to these spiritual beings. Some classification of angels is what we're talking about. And what happens in Noah's day, there was a class of angels that had intercourse with human beings and yep. they had an offspring. Offspring, yep. And that that offspring was something that lived longer um, and had some it had, had some notable characteristics in it. So that's what that story is about. Now, most of us, when we study the flood, we, we know God's judgments there, but we don't really know why. Right. This is the reason why. Mm -hmm. um, there was a group of angels that, that chose to step across that line um, and have intercourse. Now, we've spoken before that angels don't marry. Yep. Um, they're not given in marriage. There are no female angels. Angels right. are always referenced in, in the Bible as, as being male, and I've had a lot of questions about that. Matter of fact, I've had a lot of people go, why, are, why are they just female? Well, because the angels weren't, they weren't created to procreate. Right. So in other words, all the angels that would ever exist were created in one spontaneous creation, and yep. they were all created at one time. So, so we have all of them, and so there was no, they weren't to have babies. That doesn't mean they're sexless, though. Right. It just means that they weren't, to be given in marriage. There, there are no angel babies. Right. What we had here was a some type of congregation of of both angel and human, you know, like collaboration. Right. Well, and 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 it is important to note that the Nephilim, while they do have special characteristics, they're not angelic. So this is not this is not a um and Nephilim are the that's the that's the offspring, offspring. of the angel and the human Yep, so the sons of God get together with the daughters of man, and when they have intercourse, they create an offspring. But this mm -hmm. offspring is called the Nephilim. They're not called angels. Yep. They're called the Nephilim yeah, that's right. um, because they're not angels. Now, mm -hmm. they did possess special qualities that they got for sure from their angelic fathers, mm -hmm. but at the same time, they are not angelic creatures. They are just men with special, or women, men or women, I don't know, we don't have that part, but men or women with special abilities that they got from their angelic parents. So the way that we know that they're angels, though, is Job 38, 7, and then Job 1, 6. Both of those reference the sons of God as being angels. Yeah, um, and I, th I think I think it's really important when we go into this, too, is that you have to understand that the spiritual realm is way more diverse than what we've, what we've, sure. we've given it credit for. And the reason why you don't hear a lot of teaching on this is because it's hard to be definitive on it. There's yeah. so many different varieties and different ideas. But what I will say is this. If you look at the created world, the, the material world that we live in, and think about the diversity that we have here uh, among plants and animals and geography and so forth, there's no reason to believe that God become less creative in the spiritual realm than sure. he was in the physical realm. It's very creative. And so when you start hearing these titles, the reason why you know we go, well, this is a classification of these spiritual beings like angels. Um, the reason why we say that is because the Bible gives us hints. I, I'm not going to say the Bible gives us an absolute essay that we can go from and know every aspect of of the hierarchy of angels right. but it does give us some classifications of angels and i know you've put some stuff together for us to look at these classifications and different groupings and the hierarchy and authority of hierarchy of angels and and i think that's probably appropriate right here right well and i think that that so looking at at angels so we're going to pause the Nephilim story for just a second. I know we're not super far into it. Going back it, but to the flood in a minute. We're, we're going to go back to the flood in just a minute. Um, but before we do, I think in order for you to fully understand this story, we need to understand kind of the classifications of angels and the different angels that there are. Um, and so, there again, there's a lot we do not know about angels. There's a ton. But 
there is also a lot that is confirmed in Scripture. Um, the first classification and and the highest classification of angel that we have in Scripture is called the archangel um, or the archangels, depending upon how you want to kind of talk that through. But yeah. but we have one angel that carries the title of archangel, and that's yeah. Michael. Yeah. Uh, Michael is named in Scripture, and he is called the archangel. He is, yeah. he is called that. Now, when you look at uh, Lucifer in Ezekiel chapter 28, uh, the the description in Ezekiel 28 gives you a feeling that he is of the highest class of angels. If there is the word ark in archangel means chief uh, yeah. angel, and yeah. so and so if, if 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 there is a class of chief angels, yeah. the description in Ezekiel 28 of the devil seems to put him in that same class, although it does not give him the same title. Yeah. It does not give him the title of archangel, but it definitely gives him all of these compliments that would make you think he's got to be at the top. If there's yeah. a hierarchy, Lucifer and Michael are the two named creatures in uh, angelic creatures in the Bible that we go, man, they have got to be at the top and archangel is the title of the top angels. And so we are not going to say, I'm not going to say definitively that the devil is an archangel, but I will say this. I think it was very, an archangel. or was an archangel, right? Yeah. I think a very reasonable argument can be made that he and Michael are the archangels themselves. Yeah. If you look at scripture, uh, Daniel 10 uh, says princes. Uh, it talks about the princes, which we sometimes defer to term as archangel. Chief, chief, princes. Uh, chief princes. And so it says chief princes, <clears throat> S meaning plural. Um, now Jude 1 9 labels Michael as the archangel. Also in 1 Thessalonians 4 16, it labels Michael as the archangel. I have a theory about this. Again, it's a theory where I'm making some conjecture here that, that when you look at. First Thessalonians 4.16, and you look at Jude 1.9, both of those are written after the fall of Lucifer. And I think what some of their saying by targeting Michael and saying he's the archangel could be also that he's the only archangel that's still in his proper position. Yeah, Lucifer would have lost his in the fall. Again, that's a could be thing. I don't know for sure. All that to say this, archangels, as far as those that carry the title in scripture, Michael's the only one that has the title. Lucifer has a very good argument. Outside of that, we have no other named archangels in scripture. Does not mean there's not any other, just means we don't have any others named. The reason I make that such an important point is because because non-biblical writings, a lot of them interject that there are m multiple archangels. Seven is what I've read. And the thing is, is that, and they've got names on powers and all this other stuff. The problem with that is that none of those are named in scripture. None of those are named in scripture. The only one that carries the title is Michael. And the only other one that you could even make an argument for is Lucifer. One of, one of them is a ninja turtle, isn't it? Yeah, Raphael. Yeah, yeah, they've got a yeah. so so a lot so, of a lot of non biblical writings. Can, uh, they say that Raphael is a is a one archangel. Of the yeah, yeah, one of the names. Of the and archangels. We know he's a ninja turtle, so we know that's not true for sure. That's the one <laughs> right. thing we can speak on with authority. <laughs> right. We know that's not going to yeah. work. He's yeah. not running around with little Don't daggers be throwing and little, a ninja turtle little, up there among the angels. A <laughs> red sash. They, they've saved the world a few times, but not on that. <laughs> They're level. not on that level, right? And so, th so those are the archangels, and that's that's Michael specifically, but then also an argument could be made for Lucifer. The second yep. class that we're going to talk about is the cherubim, um, and the way you say this, the cherubim is plural, cherub is an individual. It's like cacti yep. and cactus. You know, it's like it's 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 a uh, it's there's a multiple and then a a singular. Um, but this is the worshiping class of angels. Mm -hmm. uh, based on scripture, it says that Lucifer was the anointed cherub, meaning that we believe that he is absolutely the leader of this class of angels. Yeah, which would, are. again would make sense with the archangels <laughs> yep. portion. Uh, would back up other things we've heard. Other places in scripture that you find cherubim, uh, they're on the lid of the ark of the covenant. Yeah, um, they are the angels that are positioned there, which is interesting. Yep. Uh, and then you have a cherub at the gate of the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3. So while Garden. this is a, a worship class of angels, um, you've got to also think that God needed one angel to guard the tree of life, and he didn't choose a warring angel. He chose a cherub, with, but that it says in Scripture that that cherub had a flaming sword, uh, and it's, you know, guarding the Garden of Eden. So, yeah. um, which the reason it's guarding the Garden of Eden is because of the tree of life. It is trying to keep us from the tree of life or anyone from the tree of life. Well, and since they, since their group kind of screwed that up, maybe they, <laughs> they got that detail. Well, and that's and then, like a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about Lucifer and how Lucifer is the, the cherub and he was in the Garden of Eden is what um, Ezekiel 28 says. He was in the Garden of Eden uh, and, and in the Garden of God. And I think the interesting part is that I think a 
piece of the Garden of Eden, or at least a large chunk of it, would have been the responsibility of the cherubim. Yeah. Um, and that's why they are still guarding it to this day. So they are worshiper angels, but they still do war um, to a yeah. degree, which we'll talk about. The second class of angels, or sorry, the third class now, so archangels, cherubim, and then there's seraphim, which is yeah. another group of angels mentioned in Scripture. These are the warring class of angels. Mm -hmm. Now, we determine based off Scripture and a lot of different things that Michael would probably be the leader of this group, which again would set up the hierarchy of God first overall. Then you've got Lucifer and Michael on the same level, which when they go to war in Revelation 12, Revelation 12 definitely hints that they're at least somewhat equal in sure. power and whatever else. Sure. But you got Michael and then Lucifer and then underneath of them you would have the seraphim and the cherubim, um, which are you know two different classes of angels for which those two reside over as leadership over those different classes yeah. of angels. Um but the seraphim are warring angels. Uh, we have one particular verse that I wanted to point out in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 2. Do you want to read that? Yeah. So, attending him were mighty seraphim. Each had six wings, two wings. They covered their face, two they covered their feet, and two they, they, they flew with. This is this vision that Isaiah has. And so, I've heard a number of times when you look at the wings themselves, um, these wings are giving us a ratio that we live by. So, so two wings cover their face. That would be worship. Yep. Um, two wings, they cover their feet. That would be walk with God. And then, then two wings they fly with. That's work for God. And I've heard people say, you know, you, you've got to, you've got to worship God. You've got to recognize him for who he is. You've got to walk with God. Um, that's a daily walk with God before you can really work for God. And I think that's a great, um, a great illustration. There's no doubt these wings and what they're doing with the wings and these seraphim, um, is giving us something that we can learn from. Now, when we walk through these particular categories of, of spiritual beings, you'll hear me say spiritual beings a lot because, the, again, the title angel means messenger or one sent. Right. It's not necessarily their title. Right. It, it, it's really more their function. function so yeah. a seraphim might be an angel yeah. because they're sent, um, but it but it also is a spiritual being. That's that's I'm what sorry. it actually is, and its title is seraphim. That's they're, they're a seraphim, so... Well, it's like anyway. calling a hammer a nail driver. It's like it is a nail driver. That's yeah. true. That that's what it does. It yeah. drives nails into things, hundred percent. But it's but it's also called a hammer. Yeah, um, it's, a, it's a hammer. Masher. Yeah, yeah finger, <laughs> finger <laughs> masher. <laughs> a, that's, a, that's what you call it. A curse word inducer, <laughs> whatever you want to call it. But but um but yeah. So so that's that's the seraphim. So again, we're not going super super deep detail. There is some more scripture. I'm going to be honest. The real reason why we're not going real real deep into detail on these is because there's not a a whole lot of solid, solid stuff um, for you to kind of stand on when no, it comes to right. factual stuff, even, right. even in scripture, as much as scripture does have a lot of detail at the same time, this is not an area that God has given just like unbelievable, easy to tell detail in That's scripture. Right. Um, and we do believe there's a reason for that, which we'll get to in a minute, but yeah, yeah. But number four, the fourth group of of, of uh, spiritual beings that are mentioned in scripture is the, are the watchers. Now, the problem with this is that they're only mentioned in the book of Daniel. They're the watchers. Um, but I want to show you the 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 verse that they're mentioned. It's Daniel 4.17. It says this, For this has been decreed by the messengers. Now, that word messengers is not watchers, but the way Scripture is interpreted, that word is synonymous with watchers. The problem with the word messengers to some degree, is that messengers is synonymous with angels. So the word angels is synonymous with messengers, and then messengers is synonymous with watchers. So again, this might not even be a class of angels. Sure. This might just be angels that Daniel called watchers for mm -hmm. some reason. Um, we don't know why. But I do think this particular verse, Daniel 4.17, it's interesting to point something out about it. It says this. This is basically when the angels are dealing with Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar has, has, has rebelled against God, has lived against God, and Nebuchadnezzar is about to get dealt with by the angels. This is Daniel 4.17. It says, For this has been decreed by the messengers. It is commanded by the holy ones, so that everyone may know that the Most High who rules over the kingdoms of the world, he gives them to anyone he chooses, even the lowliest of people. And what basically is, is going on here is that the messengers are rolling out a punishment or a... Um, a, a, a plan for what's about to happen next for Nebuchadnezzar. And I do like this first line, for this has been decreed by the messengers. So this verse at least gives me some type of indication that the messengers slash angels slash watchers at least have some discernment um, and how they execute God's will. Now, mm -hmm. it's important to note that the next two sentences, they say we're doing this in accordance with God's will. These these messengers or angels are not trying to stand on their own volition or authority, but at the same time, they are 
getting a chance to kind of choose how exactly God's plan pans out to some degree. I, I do think, though, we have to make note that that when you think that Satan was an angel <clears throat> and he made a choice to fall, yep. he made a choice to rebel against God, not only him, but a large group of them. So you have to know that angels do have their own volition. They do. They yeah. have decisions that they make. When the angel visits um, Zechariah, John yeah. the Baptist's dad, he makes the decision to where he can't talk again. Yeah. Until John the Baptist, and he doesn't born, have he to send him. that up the chain. So, or yeah, nothing. so he, he does it. So they they've been given authority, and they also have choice. Angels, in a lot of respects, like that, are like us. Yeah, they they have the opportunity to be obedient or disobedient. So 100%. I think that's kind of a kind of a powerful thing. Hundred percent. So then we've got another. This reference is 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 very vague, but this is in there. Colossians chapter one, verse 16, mm -hmm. it's thrones and dominions. It says for yeah. through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. So yeah. Colossians is is going through this and Colossians chapter 1 is a beautiful chapter. It's just it's absolutely incredible. But but Colossians chapter 1 is talking about how everything is under the dominion of God and everything was created by God and everything was created for God. Um it is for his it is for his enjoyment. It is it is simply for him. And I think what Colossians 1:16 is hammering home is that that includes the unseen <laughs> world. And there are things in the unseen world that we don't even know about that God still created and they still submit to his power and authority. Yeah, and these you see this you see this appear quite a bit in the New Testament. So what happens in the New Testament, you're going to have this these these references like here it says thrones, kingdoms or thrones, dominions, rulers. Now, Paul says it also in Ephesians, he said we wrestle not against flesh, flesh and, blood, and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in the heavenly yeah, realm. And so all of a sudden you have a you have like this these lists a couple of different times and they're listed in specific order. These are what most of us would agree are spiritual hierarchy. So these are supernatural spiritual hierarchy of the unseen world. And so so you have lists of them. Now, again, we, we don't know everything about it, but what we do know is, is that there's a lot of diversity and there's a lot going on. And we're going to actually talk more about this as we get into it. But yeah, that's an, another classification of these spiritual spiritual being. And then now we got living creatures. Living creatures. The last one that I kind of want to talk about before we get uh, to kind of moving back to the story of the Nephilim is, is the living creatures. They're mentioned a couple of times in scripture. The main time that I wanted to point out is Revelation chapter four, yeah. verses six through eight, uh, which gives a slight description of what they look like. Um, it says this, in front of the throne, uh, which is God's throne, was a shiny sea of glass sparkling like crystal. In the center around the throne were four living beings, each covered with eyes front and back. The first of these living beings was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a human face. And the fourth was like an eagle in flight. Each of these living beings had six wings and their wings were covered. Oh, sorry. Were covered all over with eyes inside and out. Day after day and night after night, they keep saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, the one who always was, who is, and who is still to come. So what, the reason why I bring this one up um, is because the living creatures are cool. It's a cool thing. But I think more than that, there's a, a greater point being made here by God and a greater, this is where the Bible has such incredible symmetry. It has such an incredible thread that runs through it and kind of all points to Jesus. So walk me through kind of what those... Each one of these four living creatures, one looks like an ox, one looks like an eagle, one looks like a man, one looks like a, where's the fourth one? Lion. Lion. There's the four. Mm -hmm. um, but those, the, each one of these creatures represents something. Kind of walk me into what those representations yeah. are, if you would. So I think a couple of things that's interesting here is that this reference, as far as the name living creatures, is used a lot with the, the, the class of, of spiritual beings known as the cherubim. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the weird deal is here is that the description matches... Um, in a lot of ways, the seraphim. It does. So so they have more wings than the cherubim do. So the right. cherubim, remember, the cherubim were on the Ark of the Covenant, and that the, the image of the cherubim that's on the Ark of the Covenant is it has they have four wings. Well, right. this one has six, and so, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to understand, and it's hard to go by descriptions to know exactly what you're talking about. Um, and, and to make matters even worse is that angels are shapeshifters. Yeah, 100%. And so the Bible tells us that angels are able to look like people. Yeah. And they do. They have appear as people and human beings at different times, you know? And so it's a pretty incredible thing uh, when we start dealing, when we start dealing with this, but these four living creatures are very specific. First of all, they're bringing, they're bringing worship 
to to the throne of God. Right. Okay, and I think that's a that's a critical part of it. And so they're they're bringing worship. And so how are they worshiping God? Well, they're worshiping God, and they have four specific attributes. And so they have the face of a lion, um, an ox, or some versions say a calf, um, uh, a man, and then an, an eagle. Um, each of these four creatures represent the gospel. Mm -hmm. And so you have the line, which is a reference to Matthew. If you look at Matthew's gospel, his genealogy that starts off in Matthew one, chapter one, um, is about, about David, mm -hmm. you know, and he's, and he yeah. references Jesus as being, as being King line is a picture of, you know, that's the, the King of the jungle, you know, right, he's right. the Absolutely. You know, Simba, hold on. <laughs> you know what <laughs> I'm right, saying? Right. And then you've got Mark. He's, he, Mark's gospel is, uh, the beast of burden, the ox, you know, he's a, he's a servant. Now there's no genealogy in, in Mark's gospel. Why? Because the servant doesn't need a genealogy. Right. Um, and he said this in Mark chapter 10, verse 45, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And that's Mark chapter 10, verse 45. And so, so Luke's gospel depicts Jesus as a man. So he magnifies the humanity of Jesus. He starts Jesus' genealogy with Joseph. So, so Matthew, the face of the lion, yep. he's portraying him as king. Mark, an ox, that's the beast of burden. Mark's gospel, Jesus is a servant. Luke's gospel depicts Jesus as a man. And then the fourth uh, gospel, John's gospel, depicts uh, Jesus, that, that's the eagle that's in the, in the living creature, depicts Jesus as God. And so that eagle is lofty. And, and, and John's gospel, you might say, well, John's gospel doesn't include the genealogy. Yes, it does. In the beginning was the nah, word, the word was with yeah, God. Right? His genealogy starts with Jesus in his position as the third part of the Trinity. And so each of the gospels, all four, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are represented in the faces of these creatures that are worshiping. God. And incidentally, I think it's important for us to realize that that the the real true worship of God will always be gospel centered. And so that's exactly what these creatures do, which we can call them angels or we can call them spiritual beings. We can call them anything they want to. Here's what we know they they're not human, you know. That'd be a freaky looking human. Yeah. yeah so, that's but weird. they're not but they're not human. Now, when we talk about these angels, one of the reasons why that that some of the, the things that we talk about aren't absolute, we don't have absolute clarity on is because the Bible primarily consists of instruction and information about the authority that we answer to right, and the authority that we're responsible for. So, so the Bible tells us who we're responsible to right, and then what we're responsible for. Angels, we are neither responsible to, Two, unless they're speaking for God, right. are responsible for them. For we don't them, tell right. angels what to do. That's the reason why it's really important. And the Bible talks about it over and over and over and over and over. And the early church had a struggle with this. We don't worship angels. Right. We don't pray to angels. No. Nope. We don't talk to angels. No. Nope. You pray to God through yep. Christ. We 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 pray to the Father through Jesus in Jesus' name. We don't pray to angels, and it's really important for us to know that. And and I think it's also important to point out that two of the major cults that we have in the world today were founded by a man who heard a word from yeah. an angel and acted upon it. I want to point out the original sin was a couple people acting on a piece of information that they got from an angel. Angels are not the authoritative source on truth. Right. So you have to be prepared for that. In fact, Paul says this in Galatians chapter 1, verse 8. He says, but even if we are an angel from heaven, why would he even include that? Think about yeah. that for a second. Yeah. Even we are an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel that's contrary to what we've preached to you. That means if somebody tells you something other than Jesus Christ come, lived among us, gave us the words of life, he is God in the flesh, he died in our place, he was resurrected on the third day. If if you have something, if you hear something other than that, a twist or turn to that, then here's what he says, that, that he might be accursed. Even if an angel were to say that, um, they, they would be accursed because that's the gospel. So angels speak on God's behalf, but it always has to be in harmony with God's word. And you, angels don't have to do the right thing. A hundred percent. Well, they have, they have some type of choice. Absolutely. And so, so in that, you know, that it could be a choice to be wrong. And obviously, like we talked about, two of the major cults in the world, um, are, were founded by a man who talked to an angel and ultimately acted on what the angel said, which is where I think first John four, one through two comes in and says, dear friends, do not believe everyone who claims to speak by the spirit. You must test them to see if the spirit they have comes from God. Meaning you could have a spirit that does not come from God. Absolutely. 
It says, for there are many false prophets in the world. This is how we know if they have the spirit of God. So, so I love how John goes in. He doesn't just say you need to test the spirits. He says, this is exactly how you know if the spirit of God is in this person or not. This is how we know if you have the spirit of God. If a person claiming to be a prophet acknowledges that Jesus Christ came in a real body, that person has the spirit of God. But if someone claims to be a prophet and does not acknowledge the truth about Jesus, that person is not from God. Such a person has a spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard is coming into the world and indeed is already here. So John is very clear to say, that there are people who speak in the spirit and yet are not speaking of a spirit of God. There's a differentiation that there are ungodly spirits and godly spirits. And then he goes into how exactly you can tell the difference. Well, you can tell the difference because what they say about Jesus, which I think is also awesome with, we've already tied this thread together a little bit. So last week we talked about with demonic possession. Jesus is your freedom. He is what sets you That's free. Right. There That's is right. no crucifix word, whatever. But then you look at the living creatures. The living creatures <laughs> depict the stories of Jesus. They, they, they literally are set up in the same way that the four gospels are. And then the gospels are what? The story of the life of Christ. Again, back to Jesus. That's and right. then even here, John, he says, how do you discern between an unclean spirit or a clean spirit or a godly spirit and an ungodly spirit? you got to go back to Jesus. So every piece of scripture that we have on anything in this realm always pulls back to Jesus and is pushing you back towards him. That's now right. with that, um, I think we need to dive back into this Nephilim story, because we talked about classes of angels. We've discussed what those look like, what all that is. And, and you're talking about the flood, because some people might not know, it, not know what the Nephilim uh, even sorry, means. Sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So Genesis chapter 6, the flood, um, and why ultimately it came. Uh, and we need to jump back into that story. So you know, walk us back in. Yeah, so so what we, what we discovered in Genesis 6 is that there was this group of spiritual beings that broke ranks yep. and they came to earth and they had intercourse with, with women with women and their offspring was some kind of supernatural slash human yep. offspring that couple that with the wickedness of man's heart and this this offspring which evidently had an extended lifespan yep drove god to to bring about a this flood. this fierce judgment a, a flood now you say, well, how do we know all of that? Well, let's look, and, and Jude writes this, and remember Jude's only one chapter, so Jude, Jude 1. Yeah, Jude verse, 1, 6, and 7, verse, although there's no Jude 2. That's right, going. verses 6 and 7, it says, um, he tells us about this. He says, and the angels who do not keep their own domain or their proper domain, but abandoned their proper dwelling place, that means their, the, the boundaries for which they were created, right. um, that God has kept them in eternal restraints under darkness for the judgment of the great day. And he goes on in verse seven. So, so interesting so, point here. Yeah, Jude tells us he tells us that there's a, a group of angels. Which, by the way, there's there's two categories of fallen angels. Um, there are the fallen free yep. and the fallen bound. There are fallen angels that are actively at work in the world that you and I live in today. And I've heard people say, "Well, um, Satan's bound and and his demonic angels are bound." They're not. Nope. That they're bound during the thousand year reign, the millennial yep. reign at the end. That's when they they're going to be bound, and they'll be in the same binding and same place that these angels are. But these angels are bound now. Right. But there are plenty of demons out there, and Satan is certainly not bound up either. Nope. Both are 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 loose. They may be limited, but they're, but they're loose, free. Yep. and and they're and they're working. And so so Jude tells us that that these this category of angels stepped outside their proper domain. They they did something that was not becoming of their particular sure. spot. Verse seven tells us what it was. Sure. It says, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they in the same way and the same way as these angels indulged in sexual perversion and went after strange flesh. So um, are exhibited as an example um, in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. So in other words, Jude says there's a group of angels, which we know is a reference to Genesis chapter 6. There was a group of angels that chose to participate in sexual perversion. God right. sets boundaries for sexuality. 100%. He sets those boundaries. And those boundaries for sexuality in God's plan consist of one man, one woman, in a covenant relationship known as marriage for a lifetime. Um, that is the only place and the only context that sexuality and sex is okay. Everything right. else, everything else is a sin. Right. And so these angels were never intended or designed to have sexual intercourse at all. 
Right. But they chose to step outside of that. And it's interesting that he uses Sodom and Gomorrah as the as the, the proving ground. What was happening in Sodom and Gomorrah? Well, you don't have to read very far to realize that there's all kinds of sexual perversions yep. and, and deviancy happening there in Sodom yep. and Gomorrah. You have the Sodomites that you have everything from, yeah, we'll just we'll just say Leave you have it everything. That. It was yeah. a lot of sexual perversion, yeah. let's just a lot say of, that. A lot of stuff Which going ultimately on. led to Sodom and Gomorrah's destruction yep. because of that. Yeah, specifically. That's, exa- that's exactly so, right. And these angels that participated in this this sexual perversion with human beings and you know, in the, the time of Genesis, um, the Bible says that God bound them. That's what he's talking about. So he said they've been they've been bound. Now you can tie this together with, with the book of Revelation. There's this place called the abyss, which is where Satan will ultimately be, be bound during the thousand year reign. In right. this abyss, these angels are kept. Now here's here's the part where this story gets really Crazy and yeah. scary. Okay, Satan is bad. Yeah, he's bad. Right? Yeah, you're talking about you're dude. talking about you're talking about a bad dude, right? Yeah, right. Um, but Satan's referenced a significant amount of times in Scripture for one reason. He's he's not bound. He's, right. He's mentioned because yeah. he's your number one threat. It's a freedom. Yeah. But there's a group of angels that yet let me say this. But yet Satan knew where his boundaries were. Yeah. Satan himself. Did didn't not do that. They did. Didn't do what these angels yeah. did. So that means there's a group of angels that chose to do something that even the devil evidently had a boundary for. I don't right. know why he yeah. had a boundary, but but he had a boundary for it. These angels didn't. Yeah. These angels are bound in the abyss. That's where they are. Um, they have a leader in Revelation. In the abyss with them. in the abyss. Yeah. So there was a leader of this group of demons, this this demonic horde of angels that that chose to they had no problem stepping across out of the spiritual realm and operating in the material realm. All the way to the point of having physical intimacy with women. With women, yeah. And having kids. Yeah. So this whole thing's crazy. Messed so up. that angel that's that or demon should i say that's in charge of them revelation chapter 19 verse 11 tells us about him now the angels that are in that abyss that have been bound all this time we we think bad things are going on now you haven't seen anything yet but in the time of the tribulation these demonic entities are loosed again right they're let loose and they will wreak havoc on planet earth and war is the result of it in right. fact it says that that one third of mankind that lives during the time of the tribulation will be killed, killed by them. Yeah, I mean, so by these angels that are in the abyss. That's right. That's right. And their their leader, incidentally, their leader, Revelation chapter nine verse eleven. It says this: It says their king is the angel from the bottomless pit. His name in the Hebrew is Abaddon, and in the Greek Apollyon. And the the name Apollyon or Abaddon means destroyer. That's destroyer, yeah. that's their leader. So. There are there are demonic entities and powerful angels that may may possibly be worse than Satan. Yeah. That are bound that one day will be will be loosed and yeah. and they're gonna run and wreak havoc um on the planet. And so um these angels that that had intercourse with these women in, back in Genesis, um, and they had children. Those angels are bound. Their offspring was destroyed in the flood, um, and that's where the reset came from. Yeah. Um, and, and in Revelation, that abyss that they are held in now will be opened back up, and they will be loosed to, right. wreak, to wreak havoc on the earth, and it will right. kill one-third of all people living on the planet on the at that one time. Yeah, um, so, and so they're, they're not pleasant angels. No, no, this is a horrible thing. I mean, it's a horrible thing, but but that's the judgment that's going to take place during that time of the tribulation. Now, here's the beauty of it. As a believer, the thing that I'm grateful for, we are a pre-tribulation rapture believing church. I right. believe that we will not be here for that time. Right. But there will be an entire generation of people that will go through the time of the tribulation and those judgments, and it'll be unlike anything we've ever seen. There'll be wickedness there, like unlike anything we've ever seen. So no, it's absolutely you're absolutely right. And so and so the the kind of bringing it all together. If you look at if you look at Jude and Jude's statement, uh, it is obvious. Job points out this is the the sons of God are angels. Yep. Um. So that's a simple connection there. So when it says the sons of God in Genesis chapter six. It, obviously, the sons of God and Job are angels, so we must assume that the sons of God in Genesis chapter 6 are also angels. Yeah. But then you've got Jude. Um, Jude it brings together what exactly these angels did that made God so mad, um, or, or maybe not made God so mad, but at least triggered the harsh punishment that flowed out from God at that point, which was to bind these angels for 
as a long time. It's been a couple mm-hmm. thousand years. On top of that, to flood the earth, the entire mm-hmm. earth. Um, so those two pieces are both very harsh. Jude sums it up that it's it's Jude is is writing his letter in opposition to religious leaders in the church who were teaching that certain things were okay when they weren't okay. That's right. That's what Jude's book really is. He's teaching right. against false teachers. He's saying, hey, there are people inside the church, which it's funny how this has always been this way since the very beginning, but there are people who claim to be Christian and who carry the Christian banner who do not represent Christ the way that Christ is supposed to be represented. Absolutely. And Jude is correcting some of this. And as he is, he reaches into kind of his historical slash biblical slash, you know, even Jesus knowledge. And he goes, okay, what are the best examples of people or things or whatever stepping out of bounds on God's rules on sexuality? Well, the two that are easily, the most easiest to point out are these angels that fell in Genesis 6 because they stepped out of bounds on God's rules on sexuality and then ultimately Sodom and Gomorrah, which also stepped out of bounds on God's rules on sexuality. The result was the same, destruction for everybody. It was no fun. Um, But that is what I think Jude is is ultimately pointing out. Um, So... Where are we going next? Well, I think that I think the rebellion too that you you need to point out is there's a difference between sin and rebellion too. Hundred percent. So so sin is sin is forgivable. Sin is right. sin is one of those things where um, sin can be. You go, I, I messed that up. Right. You know, I screwed up. Rebellion is when you look at God and you say, God, you need to reset the re, you need to reset your pattern. Sure. And I think one of the things that we have to come to grips with, especially in this rebellious generation in which, in which we live, is that when God sets a boundary for us. It doesn't have to make sense for you. It doesn't have to fit your ideas. It doesn't have to fit what you want to do. Right. Ultimately, if you're going to be a follower of Jesus, what you're saying is, is that he's my savior. That means he rescued me, but he's also my Lord. And what that means is, is that he has every right to tell me how to live. Mm. And so when when it's so it's no longer my body, it's no longer my right. choice. I live for him because I belong to him. That's right. And whatever he tells me, that's what I'm going to do. I may not like it. I sure. may have a bend sure. to want to do something different. Sure. But... I can't have the benefits of a relationship with God and live in rebellion. And rebellion, by the way, rebellion is when I look at God and I say, God, you know what? Your moral standards that you've set, I don't like them. Sure. I don't appreciate it, and sure. I don't want it to be that way. And so we live in a world that that's, that's where we are. We think we can reset every moral. We think we have a higher moral compass than God. These angels did too. They thought sure. they could do anything that they wanted to. Sure. We're going we're gonna to go and do whatever we want. Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah. We're going to do anything we want to. And, and, you know, God destroyed that place. Yeah. It, it, this... We and everything here belongs to God. Mm-hmm. He will tell us how he wants us to live and what he wants us to do and what our life should look like. And that's, it, it, you can't say, I am going to follow God. I bend my knee to him. He is my Lord. He's my savior. And he's in control of my life. You can't say that and then live any way that you want to and right. say, say, God, you're wrong. I'm sorry. Would You need to re- retract sure. this and you need to rethink this thing because, you know, I like doing this. So if I like doing this, then therefore you need to make it okay doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. And that's absolutely where we were in the in in the days of Genesis. You you not only had this supernatural activities that are happening, but you had people, humanity that was going, yeah. we'll do anything we want to. You know? well, and Genesis 6 says, it says that they were corrupt in everything they thought and said. Everything. I mean, everything they thought and said was corrupt, which again, and I think is important to highlight here is that, you know, uh, there's a difference, and this is a little bit off topic, but still, there, there, there's a difference between desire and action. There's a difference. Like, no doubt, there's times where I desire to do things that would be absolutely wrong. And if I acted upon those desires, that would be horribly wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, so that doesn't mean that just because God has a standard that, like you said, I'm always going to be like 100% like, well, this is exactly what I want to do. Well, no, I, there's times where I'd really like to be able to do the things that I just want to do. And those things, but those things are out of bounds for what God desires for my life or what God says in his word. And I've got to eventually yield to his word over even my own desires. But you can even look in, in, if you go back and look in human history, though, human history reveals that every single kingdom that's ever come to power, whether it's the Medo-Persians or the, the, the Romans or the Greeks or whomever, whenever they come to power, when they became morally deprived, wickedness took them over. When, when, our, when morally, when we give up the truth of God's word about, about moral issues, we are at almost the very end. Usually mm. that is the last thing, the last ground. You 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 look at a place that's morally pure, you'll see a place that is pure in, in other aspects. You show up, you look at a place that's morally impure. 
You know, think about the more wicked places in, in say, our country or in the world. Um, when you talk about places that have a red light district, there's yeah. wickedness everywhere. So, yeah. so you get Las Vegas. You know, you, you've got these brothels and everything else, but but you know what? There's wickedness everywhere else. So so this sexual immorality in Genesis chapter six, that sexual immorality is is it's just it's fertile ground because there's 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 decay everywhere. There's right. rebellion against God everywhere. There's unholiness everywhere. There's unrighteousness everywhere. And that's the same thing true for us. And and you know we're 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 either on the cusp of of a revival. Yeah. And us saying, you know what, we've tried it this way, and we're now seeing the devastation. We're seeing the diseases. We're seeing the sicknesses. We're seeing the destruction. We're seeing, you know, our kids being destroyed. We're seeing the minds of people being destroyed. We're seeing the lives and marriages being destroyed. We're seeing all that. God, forgive us. We're turning back to you. Revival or judgment. That's the yeah. only, that's the end result of sin, and that's where we were in Genesis chapter six. It 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 wound up coming to coming to judgment. Well, and sin usually pushes you to one of those two places: that's either it. repentance or ultimately to your own destruction, which is sad but true. Um. So so, who are these angels? I think is the is the next portion that we're going to dive into, and 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 a, and a quick kind of thing is is in Job thirty eight and verse seven. Um, this is an interesting kind of portion, but Job 38, seven says this says when the morning stars sang together and all the son of sons of God shouted for joy, uh, you and I were talking about this kind of before. Again, I, I want to be completely clear. There are a lot of these things that we cannot be definitive on. We cannot be definitive, not because we don't want to be definitive, not because more research would yield more definitiveness, but I believe that God leaves some obscurity in this on purpose, um, that, that we don't know all of what all this looks like, but we can make reasonable assumptions based on what scripture is saying. Now here in Job, again, Job 38, seven, it says when the morning stars sang together, that sounds like one group of something. And then it says, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So that sounds like two groups of something. There's sons of God and there's morning stars. Now we know based off scripture that Lucifer himself is referred to as the morning star. We mm -hmm. know that he is a cherub. So the assumption that I'm making here, and we, you could talk me through it, but the assumption that I'm making here is that the morning stars in this verse are the cherubim mm -hmm. because that would be them singing. They're worshipers. Singers are worshipers. And the devil is called the morning star, son of the morning um, in Ezekiel 28. So again, this is morning stars sang together. And then all the sons of God shouted for joy. Now the difference is that shouted versus singing, a shout is a warrior's chant and a singing is a worshiper's thing. So my thought here is that the morning stars would pattern after the all, the one who's called the morning star, which is the devil, who is a cherub or a cherub, and this would be the cherubim. But then you also have the sons of God, who would be the seraphim. The seraphim are warriors. They would have a shout, not a sing. They don't do the singing thing. They do the shouting thing. And so they're the warriors of heaven. And so these two are singing together in God's presence. This is at the laying, uh, or sorry, this yeah, this is at the laying of the foundation of the earth. They're singing and shouting together, praising God. This is cherubim and seraphim together. But I think the point that this brings us to with Genesis chapter six is that Genesis chapter six says it was the sons of God who broke their proper abode. Jude chapter one, verse seven, six, sorry, says that it is the sons of God, not the morning star, says the sons of God. I think a reasonable assumption could be made here that it is the seraphim, or at least some of the seraphim, who break rank and come down to earth. Yeah. So if you look at the two major classifications of angels, so of, of what we would call spiritual beings, sure. and I'm going to, I believe that this is true, and I don't know that I could really argue it, but I believe the two classifications of spiritual beings, you have the cherubim yep. with who I believe would be Lucifer or, or the devil now would have been the as one the leader there is the yep. leader of that. And then you have the seraphim that the leader of that category of spiritual beings would be Michael. Right. I would say that that's the two larger classifications of spiritual beings in right. heaven. So that would probably be your, your larger group. So I agree with you. I think the morning stars that sing, that fits the, the category cherubim. of cherubim, yeah. the, the, worship, the worship leaders of heaven. <clears throat> now, the second half of that is that the sons of God shouted for joy. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I, I think the sons of God is probably the seraphim. I, I think what, what, what's important about this to think about is, is that when the devil chose to rebel against God, it wasn't just the people in his category 
that came Very after convinced, him. Yeah. So not only him, them, but I would say most likely many of the angels or the seraphim who followed Michael, the archangel, broke ranks yeah. and went and went with the devil. That tells you how compelling he is. It's that tells compelling, you yeah. how, how powerful he is. And it does say the sons of God, which means that the angels that followed Michael actually did to some extent worse than what the angels did that followed Lucifer or the devil. Sure. And so, which is kind of a crazy thing, but I do, pl I, I always relate things back to church. And I think in church, we've seen this. It's, it's crazy that there will be people that will be with you in one season of your ministry and another season, they'll just leave you, sure. you know, and they, they sometimes leave in a bad way, you know, sure. and they sometimes go out and throw rocks over the fence at you, you know, or whatever. Um, but, but that happened to God in heaven. That's how, that's yeah. how powerful sin is. Sin can confuse us. Sin can, can cause us to want to sell something out and, these guys sold it out in a big way. And I, I don't know, I think to myself, I wonder how Michael must have felt. You know what I'm yeah. saying? I mean, yeah. it, the dudes he, you know. So he, his own command would have would have abandoned and would have gone with Lucifer. Yeah, went out there to, well, and know, it's party. And it, well, and it's interesting, too, that when, you know, in Revelation, when the abyss is opened and the, the destroyer is let loose and his angels whom follow him, um, when that happens, war is the result yeah. of that letting loose, which again would would result would 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 at least to some degree support the notion that they're seraphim angels who are warring yeah. class angels who come down, they indulge themselves with women uh, and and the world in general, and they teach these things and do these things. Or otherwise, they're, they may have popped out and give us just a bunch of gangster rap. <laughs> just a bunch of they got hymns for you but some explicit, uh, no, some right. explicit content gangster rap <laughs> right <laughs> right and so like they're not the they, they don't seem to be the worshiping class although we talked about that cherubs can also do war we're not saying they can't but at the same time you know when you look at the seraphim they are the warriors that's who they are and since when the abyss is opened in revelation they are let loose and when they are let loose the result is war across the across the world so it's kind of when leonidas calls out to the spartans and he says what do you do they don't go we are the chip <laughs> something like that <laughs> they say oh, oh, right? oh, yeah, oh. that's it that's it that's i'm it. not that, recommending that i'm not recommending that show. right yeah I'm we just, don't recommend that movie at i'm just all. saying <laughs> hypothetically yeah if you saw it if somehow i think i feel like we've we've exhausted um, this, I do think it's a, a powerful thing. One of the takeaways that I do think, you know, as we kind of start to wrap this up, I think is that I really believe that understanding that we are spiritual beings yep. living in a material world. Yep. So you, you are, you are a soul and a spirit. It just so happens you're living in a body right now Yeah. to keep that in mind. you the soul and spirit of you is more real than your body is. Your body's going to die. Yeah. Your body's temporary. So, your soul and spirit is more real than your than the material part of who you are. Right. And with that understanding, spiritual influences are really a big deal. Yeah. Angels have the ability to encourage us and strengthen yeah. us. Good angels. They strengthen us emotionally, physically, and actually. Um, <clears throat> which would stand a reason that demonic activity could demoralize you, yeah. weaken you, depress and depress, depress you. you. Yeah. You know, they can give you false information, you with anxiety. false ideas. Yeah. You know, they can, that's right. You know, Paul says to Timothy, he, said, he says, you've not been given the spirit of fear. Yeah. So fear is a spiritual thing. So 100%. we're way more affected by the spiritual side of things, I believe, than, than we give ourselves credit for. And I think that seeing this and seeing where you have a group of angels that actually, in fact, came to the earth and had sex with people. Dang, man. Mess some things up. Dude, that's, that's the truth. Just, I mean, that's a big deal, though. I mean. That's huge. Yeah. Now, now think about this. They were still allowed to possess people yep. after this. And yep. that was not an infraction enough to where they would be, you know, cast into a pit. But you have to remember in, in Genesis, what God is doing and the reason why he intervenes is because God's plan is to reveal himself and to to bring Christ as salvation. Genesis chapter six, we get to an impasse where looking forward and fast forwarding to the future, Jesus will not there won't be a a, a, a Mary. There won't, right. there won't be right. an opportunity for the, the, the Messiah, the Savior, to be born because the wickedness of humanity will be so saturating. Um, it, there will be no, no one righteous on the yeah, earth. No redemption. Um, but, but fortunately for us, praise God, 
you got Noah. Right. <laughs> and the Bible says that God, Noah found favor in the eyes God. of the Lord, which yep. is what a great, which Safe. does tell you that you can live in a world of wickedness, spiritual wickedness, crazy ideas, and you can still live right. Still live right. That's you right. Can, you can still be a preacher of righteousness, and Noah did that. That's right. Know? That's Not right. Not perfect, but he did it. He did. He did. We are going to stop there, guys. It's been an incredible week. It's mm -hmm. been an incredible week. Next week, we are going to dive into the angel of the Lord. Um, send in your questions. Be sure to comment them below and let us know what you think. And, guys, we will see you all Sunday.